Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Welcome back, everybody. This is John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. Uh, today's a special guest, actually a good friend of mine, Dr. Daniel Stein out of Sarasota, Florida. And here's a great little intro. Cannabis got me interested in neuroscience, and now I'm returning the favor. So welcome, Dr. Stein. Um, Dr. Stein's formal studies included a neuroscience bachelor's degree at the University of Rochester, New York, a medical degree at Albany uh, Medical College, neurology residency at the Cleveland C uh, Clinic Foundation, and neuromuscular fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Stein is happily married to Joyce, who I haven't met yet, as well as your four, four daughters, which I haven't met. Uh, but I have met, and what you don't add in here, is your beautiful dog, Brody. So how's Brody doing? He's good. He's right over there. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can get a little cameo, cameo with Brody, too. Um, Dr. Stein is practicing. He's a practicing neurologist in Sarasota, Florida, associate professor in clinical medicine at Florida State University Medical School, and is the owner of the, uh, of his, uh, I guess, your, your clinic called Neurology of Cannabis uh, in, in beautiful Sarasota, Florida. And um, it's a great office. I've filmed in Dr. Stein's office. We were there for a week and and did a master class on, on, uh, on brain, um, yeah, the science of the brain and the healthy brain. And, but uh, he takes patients, you know, we're in the midst of COVID right now, but takes patients via phone as well as uh, telemedicine. And uh, is Chanel still with you? She sure is. Awesome. She's wonderful. So uh, if you do give Dr. Stein a call, and I'll leave all that information here. Uh, Chanel is his gatekeeper, so uh, be nice to her. So mm -hmm. welcome, Dr. Stein. Good to have you on the show. Thanks so much, John. So what have you been up to, my friend? It's, uh, we've done a lot together over the years, and, and uh, thank you for, for being open again to, to come on uh, on the podcast here at United Patients Group. My pleasure. I'm happy to help spread the word. And, uh, you know, when we did that program with yeah. the Brain Masterclass, yeah. it uh, it helped put me on the radar, on the internet radar. So I've been getting other calls, uh, doing some writing, doing some other presentations. So thank you very much for that. Awesome. It was always, it's always uh, fun working with you. And then I want to talk about what you're doing uh, and your upcoming speaking events as well, too. And we'll get in that, too. So, you know, neuroscience, how did you become, you know, a New Yorker? Making it down, well, a lot of New Yorkers make it from north to south, and so that, that was kind of silly, but, but how did you get involved with cannabis? Well, like, like you said at the opening, uh, yeah. cannabis got me interested in neuroscience initially because when I went to college with my friends uh, on the first floor of the Gilbert Dormitory, uh, we, we experimented a little with cannabis, and I became very interested in how that all worked, you know, the science of brain and behavior. And there was a, a, a major available called biopsychology. And that was an old combined degree between biology and psychiatry. So I talked to some professors and we actually put together a new major called neuroscience. And I got my bachelor's in neuroscience because I was interested in brain and behavior, how marijuana affected brain and behavior. And that's how it all started my that was my my entrance into neuroscience studies, which which is, you know, we you and I've had so many different conversations here, um, because cannabis normally is taught in schools, especially back then, and so you were kind of ahead of head of the game, um, in 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 studying this and the effects of the brain, and again, which brought you into your career now. And so, what have you seen? Because this is going on twenty some years now. Right. Well, you know, we've been in Sarasota for 27 years, and I did my studies at, in Rochester back in 82. I turned 60 this year, John. I'm, Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I, and you look professional because I wasn't expecting you to put, a, put, a, put a, a jacket on, especially in Florida in the middle of summer. And, uh, you know, but you, you look good as, as always. I turned 53 this year, so I'm 
right behind you, my friend. Right on. Well, hopefully we're, we all, we both have a long way to go. And cool. Cool. You know, I think that, uh, you know, cannabis is uh, actually giving me a little bit of rejuvenation, you know, professionally, uh, because my neurology practice up until just a few years ago was focused on traditional medicine. I did my fellowship at National Institutes of Health. I was a clinical scientist in a very um, conservative sense. Even though cannabis made me interested in neuroscience initially, my training was strictly Western. And so it didn't really involve a whole lot of any kind of therapeutics, plant medicine, none of that um, until recently. And now this sort of renaissance in plant medicine in the West and cannabis in particular has been a real shot in the arm for me. I, I, we're enjoying it very much. And so you, you bring up the, the, the Western, I guess, trained physicians. And so how do you see that combination going? Because, you know, there is a stigma, still is a stigma in this. And, and, and I'm liking what I'm seeing that a lot of these medical professionals are kind of opening their eyes to other modalities and doing a combination. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a fan of bringing an arsenal to the game uh, if, if, it, if it helps patients. I think, I, think the, uh, I think the barn door is open and uh, there's no shutting it. You know, Western trained physicians are now basically being forced to learn something about cannabis medicine because it's, it's legal for medical use in 33 states. Mm -hmm. Uh, recreational, I believe, still 11, and patients are asking for it. So doctors need to learn about it. So out of just sheer necessity, Western-trained physicians who never learned anything about cannabis medicine in medical school are being forced to open their minds and uh, embrace consultants like myself so that we all can learn together. And so what, what have you seen, because your practice is not only, you know, people think uh, uh, brain issues for elderly, you know, dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, but you're seeing a whole gamut of patients coming in there, right? Sure. Well, neurology, the discipline of neurology, some may not realize, includes not only dementia and stroke and things like that, which you were saying, but also back pain, neck pain, um, Tourette syndrome, uh, problems with development, autism, and also uh, develop, uh, acquired problems, you know, brain tumors, um, mm. epilepsy, things like that. So it's the, the, the science of neurology really encompasses a very wide range of problems. And so in your practice, when you have patients coming in there, uh, are these patients that are total cannabis naive patients that, that, that are just looking for something else. I mean, I mean, you're the name of your practice, you know, <laughs> neurology of cannabis just says it right there on your door. And so, um, you know, what do people say when, when, I mean, this is this, Hey, we're trying to find other things or we saw you on a TV show or, 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 you know, another show and, you know, and we'd like to see what our options are. How does that work out? I think it's probably 50-50 between cannabis naive patients yep. and patients who have been self-medicating in some way, shape, or form, but want additional guidance and they want to become legal. You know, so, so we have a lot of people that have some experience and now they want to take it to the next level. But also, like I mentioned, all these other doctors that are referring their patients to me that are cannabis naive, the older population, for example. And it's a bit of a dance we do when we have a conversation about cannabis yeah. therapy because I don't want to, um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. So uh, my usual um, opening is something like, we're going to talk about cannabis today and you may have some experience with cannabis already. And then they either volunteer that information or not. And then we go from there. It's funny that you say volunteer because a lot of parents don't want their kids to know, really, mom, you've been yelling at me this whole time for, for trying cannabis and you actually tried it back then. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I've run into that. I even rock, talked to old high school friends that have come back to me and say, thank you. And I said, for what? They said, my mom is actually 
you know, trying cannabis. And I said, why are you thanking me? He's like, I've been trying to tell her for years, but of course she comes to you, John. And, uh, you know, and, and that makes it okay. And it's like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, I'm not a parent, but I'm an uncle. And so uh, I can get my little nephew to do things that mom and dad can't get him to do. And so uh, I think having, you know, uh, that support system and sharing. And now that it's, I don't say widely accepted in the medical route, but having a doctor talk about it, because not all doctors are open to this. And I say that because I work with a lot of uh, 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 retirement communities. And I ask that question, how many of you have had this conversation with your doctor? And some hands, some hands go up, other ones saying, you know, I've had this conversation and my doctor says, you know, if, you, if I hear you using this, I'm going to ask you to get another doctor. And I just think that's wrong. And I don't want uh, our listeners or patients out there. And I always tell them, even if you live in an in, in illegal state, it's not illegal to have that conversation. And if you don't have, if your doctor's not open to it, ask him or her, do you have any recommendations of, of other uh, doctors in this field that um, recommend cannabis. And I'm certain that happens with you. Uh, you must get recommendations from other doctors in your field that say, I'm not up to speed on uh, cannabis in the brain, uh, but I know uh, Dr. Stein is and, and uh, you know, here's his number, give him a call. And so I'm assuming that, I think we talked about that, that you do get a lot of recommendations, referrals from other doctors in your area. I do, and I'm I'm happy to see those patients, and and very happy to see those doctors being open-minded, and I, I you know the tide is is definitely turning, so yeah, we'll we'll see less um, and less uh, of those you know those prohibitionist attitudes. So so yeah. that is that is definitely changing. You know, and, and Florida is coming around too. You know, I remember back in the day, Florida and Texas, we had a lot of patients that would call us from Florida and Texas, saying you know we don't have access. And then when Florida opened up, you know, you have a lot of your uh, snowbirds that come down, and, you know, and, and are happy to treat. And that's another, another thing when you talk about it becoming a cannabis refugee, when you really don't have to become a cannabis refugee, but let's get back on what your, your practice is about um, the neurological side and the neuro conditions. One that comes up quite a bit lately. And uh, it, it was shocking to me that this is one of the, Top, uh, I don't say killers, but I guess you could, could say killers. I was thinking it was is cancer and other things, but Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is on that list of the top three or top five um, uh, killers in adults, right? Sure. Well, it's you know those are the the most common degenerative illnesses. We call Parkinson's and Alzheimer's um, degenerative illnesses because it's a progressive age-related loss of function. Over time, there's more and more problems that develop. So those are the most common degenerative illnesses in adults, yes. And, and why, why are we seeing more of that today than we did growing up, you know, when we were your kid's age? I think there's a few reasons. You know, um, people are aware of it for starters. Yeah. So, you know, we have a better diagnosing and, and, and better communication. So we're just hearing about it more. Plus the population is, is living longer. So, you know, if you live long enough, chances are you're going to lose enough nerve cells, even you and I eventually, and then develop one of these degenerative illnesses. You run out of dopamine, for example, and you'll get Parkinson's. You run out of acetylcholine. These are neuro, neurotransmitters. And then you'll get Alzheimer's so, or something similar. And um, I think a lot of it, uh, you know, has to do with education. You know, people are getting educated about it and uh, we're living longer and we're doing better at making the diagnosis. Is, uh, I'm, it's funny, I'm going to go off a little track here. I'm reading a book and I was thinking about the other day. It's uh, Into the Magic Shop uh, by Dr. Dodie Dottie. And, uh, uh, you know, he's a neurosurgeon. I, I know it's all with the brain, but... Um, Anyway, when I was reading that, I was thinking about you. Another thing I recently found out too is the eyeballs are the only part of the brain that's out of the skull. Oh, that's the only part of the central nervous system. Central nervous system, but but, but it's connect. It is part of the brain. Yes, most definitely. And anyway, they, I heard, I heard, they are the sorry. gateway to the soul. Remember? Yes. Yes. So Makes that's sense. interesting. Yeah, definitely. Very good. 
And so, uh, see, I mean, I, 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 you're in my mind. Just, I mean, we haven't seen each other for since COVID, <laughs> but uh, I think about you quite a bit uh, and learned a lot uh, over the last few years of working with you as well. You know, with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and we'll tie in in, in, in dementia. And so, um, share. Can you share how they're all connected? Because Dementia and Alzheimer's, and they're, they're all kind of intertwined with each other, correct? Yes, in that broad category of degenerative illnesses. And that's, uh, that's something that I think most of your listeners will have some connection to, either with a, you know, a family member or, or with personal concerns, because everybody gets old, God willing, old enough, and then something happens. So degenerative illnesses like Parkinson's and dementia and uh, other conditions uh, like Huntington's disease, uh, yeah. you know, for example, are age-related loss of nerve function, which we're still trying to understand. And one of the things, for example, that we're learning is that oxidative damage to the nerve cells for which people take antioxidants like vitamin E or vitamin C yeah. can help protect the neurons. And cannabis is a very potent antioxidant. So in experiments, uh, bench experiments, not so much clinical, but preclinical experiments, we're learning that the antioxidant properties of cannabis may help slow down degenerative illness by way of being antioxidant. And one of the things I like to at least amuse myself by thinking about is the Neil Young's, the Neil Young uh, album and song, you know, that Rust Never Sleeps. You know how Neil Young talks about Rust Never Sleeps? Well, that's oxidative damage. Yeah. Rust is oxidative damage to iron. And Rust Never Sleeps because it's always being oxidatively damaged. And, and that's what's unfortunately going on in our brains and bodies. Yeah. And if you can reduce oxidative damage, perhaps by using cannabis in a prophylactic way, yeah. to prevent and protect, prevent damage and protect nerve cells. I believe that there's a chance that we can at least delay enough nerve damage to preserve nerve function. That's one of the really exciting parts of cannabis and neurodegenerative disease. So when do you, when do you, in your opinion, when do you think that type it, you know, that rust, uh, you know, affects, starts happening in our brain, the neurodegenerative damage. Is it 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s? I mean, where, is it all the above? All the above. Rust never sleeps, John. When you, wow. when you're born, yeah, the metabolic machinery in your body produces these oxygen radicals, they're called. These oxygen radicals are molecules of oxygen that, need to bind to something. They're, they're radicals, they're open, they're like ions. And these oxygen radicals are produced as a part of normal metabolism at any age. And your body has to handle those oxygen radicals with antioxidant functions to maintain cellular health. And so that's day one to, the, wow. to your last day, your body is handling oxidative damage. So incorporating cannabis for a patient to incorporate cannabis into their protocol for prevention, if you want to say, um, because the topic comes up of, of, uh, of, you know, an adolescent's brain. Uh, when is it, when is too young, too young to try cannabis? Um, you know, and your recommendation is um, from our previous conversations generally isn't always about smoking. It's more, are you, are you still with the sublingual absorption that way? Or what, what, what are you looking at nowadays? Well, you know, especially in the time of COVID, you want to protect the lungs as much yeah. as possible. Um, so yes, in general, inhaling your cannabis therapy may not be, you know, the best way, especially, you know, if you're young or if you're old and have pulmonary issues. Yeah. And you, you don't have to inhale cannabis to get the effects. So it, it's, it seems to make more sense medically to use things like tinctures and capsules, edibles, things like that. It, because cannabis is so wide, you know, well, I, I, it's funny, I always talk about this, you know, six months ago, I was saying there's about 113 different cannabinoids. Now I'm at the 
140 mark on cannabinoids. And generally I'm seeing 120 to 160. Uh, where, where are you on that lineup? I'm there with the 140. You know, yeah. I, I recently saw some articles by Dr. DiMarzo, Vincent DiMarzo and Didi Amieri from Technicon. Yes. And, yes. and, and they're, they're in the 140 range. And that's kind of where I'm taking my cue on that. And just so just I just want to go back just to cover this one thing about in, inhalation therapy. Yeah. Um, because I know there's people out there that are saying to themselves, no, I don't agree. Inhalation is the way for me. And the answer is to that, yes, absolutely. There are situations where inhalation is the best way. Um, and of course, this is very independent medicine. People choose their own route of administration. And I, I love that. Um, but in general, for medical care, inhalation therapy is preferred if you need immediate response. So let's say you're having a migraine. You're not going to sit around and wait for an edible to kick in. Yeah. You need to inhale your medicine, get rid of that migraine, and, and be on your way. So there's a, there's, um, there's a time and a place, I think, for each of the administration methods. But what we were talking about before in terms of preventative, yeah. dioxidant, health maintenance type of thing, I don't think you need to inhale to, to achieve that. So the, the quick content. And so that's why I was going in with the cannabinoids because we really had spoken about the cannabinoids leading up here. And are you seeing, so the cannabinoids for our listeners that, that are cannabis naive or not, in the cannabis plant, uh, cannabinoids are, well, I'd say the, the most popular that everyone knows is THC. THC has been around. That's a, that's a cannabinoid. CBD, which you're seeing everywhere nowadays, is another cannabinoid. CBA, CBG, CBN, they, and all 140 of these cannabinoids have uh, their purpose. Uh, the goal is not to get high. People think, oh, I want to I want to stay away. I don't want the recreational part of the plan. I want the, 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 the medical part of the plan. I personally believe that they're all, they all have the benefits of being uh, med, med, medical in some way or, some way or form. Um, wine you know my brother's been in the wine business for 30 years and so you can have a sip of wine or you can have three bottles of wine sip of wine you're not going to feel anything three bottles of wine you're definitely going to feel something and the same thing with thc you know thc is very beneficial at the same time you can have minute amount two to five milligrams ten milligrams depending on how your body reacts to that and still have some great success so in your practice dr stein with preventative um are you incorporating um the other cannabinoids Yes, and and use and and using mainly whole flour, uh, and whole flour. Yeah, because you know we don't we don't have a a good extraction um, method that that is equal to what nature provides. And if you could extract all the cannabinoids and recreate the balance of a whole plant. Whole plant. So when you're, excuse me, when you were saying whole flower, I'm thinking, I was thinking that you were getting the flower and, and, and the bud and, and, and smoking, but you're, you're, I'm with you. Whole plant. Yeah. So that's where all the cannabinoids live. Right. And so, you know, I think it's, I, I think at this stage in the science of cannabis medicine, we don't know which combination of cannabinoids works best for which conditions. We just yeah. don't know. So you can break it down and use THC or CBD or you know, CBG. And I think that's fine for some things, but in general, since we really don't know, it's, I think, safe and more likely to be effective to use the whole plant when possible. And I, I like how you said it. it's not a one size fits all. So what works for me may not work for you or your other patients that have the exact same, you know, senior male, early stage Parkinson's or dementia. One may have success with one formulation or ratio or, or cannabinoid while the other one um, might find, have something else. So finding that sweet spot is really important. And that's why I'm a big advocate and a big fan of having a medical professional involved uh, uh, when it comes to recommendation of cannabis, you know, because you do look at the age of the patient, weight of the patient, the sensitivity of the patient, what they're going through. And in a lot of cases, the drug to drug interaction too. And so with your, because Parkinson's dementia and Alzheimer's is such a big topic right now. What are you seeing? And I know, again, 
I'm kind of second guessing myself because it's not a one size fits all. But what do you, what are you what are you seeing with your your patients that are that are uh, I guess having success? It depends on what they want to achieve. You know, everybody has certain symptoms that bother them the most. And now we're not talking about slowing down the underlying disease process, which yeah. is the, for example, the oxidative damage, but rather symptomatic therapy. And that's really uh, the reason most people come to the clinic. They have a symptom. They want to treat it. Uh, and, and we can talk about you know, general health, maintenance, and all that, but mostly people come in because they have a symptom. They can't sleep. Uh, they can't eat. They they're restless and agitated. Um, they 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 drool too much. You know, there's all these different symptoms that bother people in those categories of Parkinson's and, and dementia, and we address those you know one at a time and try to come up with an effective treatment protocol to address that particular symptom. And are you seeing? I don't want to say reversal, but are you seeing success in, in slowing the progression down? No, I can't say uh, that we are. Uh, uh -huh. You know, it's you know, in order to see a decrease in progression, you really have to follow patients for at least two or three years. Uh -huh. um, you have to compare them to other patients in in a similar situation. It's difficult, really, to demonstrate that in the clinic. And so with somebody that has maybe it's, it's it, and is this topic always comes up, you know, uh, is it hereditary? Is it hereditary? Some of these degenerative illnesses are hereditary. Uh -huh. you know, there's a, there's hereditary forms of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and of course, Huntington's, but there's also sporadic is the other way it goes. Sporadic cases are those cases that develop without a genetic predisposition, as far as we know. So the answer is yes and yeah. no. <laughs> so. and, and, and how does it work on the brain? I'm, I'm gonna, I had an email who, this is a, a lady that actually that wrote us in, for, uh, contacted me from Germany and she saw us on our master class. And so she was asking a question and I said, actually, I'm gonna be on with Dr. Stein today. And, and uh, uh, I go, what's your question? And I'll ask. So she's saying, hey guys, uh, for someone, a friend who has been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, if he does a cannabis therapy vaporizing one to one ratio of THC to CBD, how likely is it that the THC will compromise his short term memory while hopefully reducing the inflammation in his brain? For what I've read and heard in your classes and presentations that cannabis therapy is helpful holding off dementia while the short term memory aspects uh, don't get mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm almost done here. After one year, my friend's cannabis therapy, his short-term memory has gotten worse, at least not better. We don't know how his inflammation has improved. Um, he for now has stopped the cannabis therapy. Uh, I, I did look for case studies on this, but could only find indications that there are not enough studies and they need to be completed over time. Um, and so can you add to that and help, help, help answer that question? I, I love that question. You know, that's an educated consumer right there. Yeah. You know, we, we all know. I think she, wa she watched our course. That's why. I'll tell yeah. You. Right on. Right on. So, um, but yeah, no, that, that's it. That's uh, so Ingrid has followed us. And so, yeah, if you. So the, the well-known effect that cannabis reduces short-term memory turns out not to be as much a problem in most older patients as you might think. And I can tell you personally, uh, when I first started using cannabis therapy in patients with early Alzheimer's, I was concerned that their short-term memory would get much worse as a result. And, and if you're careful and don't use too much THC, it doesn't turn out to be that much of a problem. Um, and if you can use a a, a plant extract or a whole plant a product that has pinene, which is one of the terpenes, that medicine, that medicine, that part of the plant medicine actually can enhance memory because it provides the opportunity for more acetylcholine to hang around the, the neurons. So pinene can counteract the short-term memory effects of THC. 
And so that's a, that's something that that particular listener and maybe some other people in your audience might be interested in. Good. In general though, the, the dude, where did I leave my car problem um, doesn't seem to be that obvious in patients with Alzheimer's, maybe because the nerve cells in their hippocampus are not working that well to begin with. I don't know, but um, it doesn't turn out to be that much of a problem. <laughs> well, I, I'm laughing here. Why is it that sometimes when you, you use cannabis, you remember things you're like, oh my gosh, I would never, why, what, what, what brings that on? Yeah. Well, during the, the, the dude, dude, where's my car? Yeah. You're, you're talking about during the cannabis experience you have. Yeah, and you're like, oh my gosh, if, if I wasn't on cannabis right now or, or intoxicated, I would never have thought about that and I would have forgotten it. I mean, how, you, how does that work out? All right, John, I'm going to give you a, a, a memory physiology lesson here that yeah. you're going to really enjoy. Okay. There's two parts to memory function. One is registration. You have to put the information in. And the other is retrieval. You have to get the information out. And if either of those are not working, you have a memory problem. Okay. Now, some people have a problem with registration. They don't put the information in. They're distracted. They're not focused. Um, their, their hippocampus isn't working. They can't register information. And if you can't register the information, there's no way you can recall it later because it's not in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are some people that have the memories registered, but they can't pull them out. And that's the part that I think you were just mentioning. Those memories, those thoughts are in there, but they're not accessible until you use cannabis to maybe open up some of those parallel networks. And then you can access those, those memories and those thoughts through different pathways. So you're retrieving memories better when you're high, let's say. Yeah. And, uh, and patients that have memory issues when they're smoking cannabis are probably not... Um, creating the memories well enough. It's not so much the recall as it is they're not generating the memories. So that's like a hard drive on your computer that's full and you do a, uh, what do you call it, uh, a systems reload where they kind of like, okay, we're opening this up and we're going to bring all the memory back in there too. So right. anyway, that, what's that? So there you go. You, yeah. you, you can't retrieve what you never saved in the first place. And sometimes it needs a little opening, uh, open the mind. And, and open the, the mind so you can access those memories. But if you're too distracted and there's too much going on, you're not going to create the memory and then that's it. You're not going to be able to retrieve it. So this, gotcha. the, two, gotcha. the two parts. Daniel Stein, <laughs> lesson by Daniel Stein. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. I, I'm just, I'm just the vehicle here, John. I'm just okay. trying to well, pass good. it through. I like, I like the vehicle. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk about, uh, I mean, we can go on for hours and hours and hours. I mean, we talk about CTE, we can talk about, you know, pain, um, um, autism. Um, let me go back into, you know, I was, I was listening to a podcast with Joe Namath, the famous Joe Namath, you know, New York Jets. And mm -hmm. were you a Jets fan from being up there or are you a Giants fan? I was. Fan? No, I was actually a Jets fan. Yes, sir. So, with all the, he's had about, I want to say eight to 10 different concussions and then eight to 10 different, he, eight, eight to 10 con concussions in his lifetime, I believe is what I, what I, re what I recall what he was saying. Um, he was doing some hyperbaric chambers actually down in Florida. And they showed from the studies and, and scans that the white spots were uh, rejuvenating itself. Um, is that, you know, I heard that, I, you know, a few months ago, I was like, I can't wait to get on this call with Dr. Stein and we can talk about that. Have you heard about that with hyperbaric and regenerating the brain? I have, and I'm not sure that it's a genuine therapy ready uh, for prime time just prime, yet. Exactly, huh? Uh, you know, it depends, a lot of what you're referencing depends on how the brain is studied, you know, if it's the white spots, that's usually what people refer to when they see the MRI scan. Yes. But if you're doing a more sophisticated measure of amyloid plaques, which develop from multiple concussions, yeah. then you're going, you're going to need a PET scan. Okay. PET. And I don't so, know which one he had. Yeah. So if, 
So, you know, if someone is doing a hyperbaric treatment because um, they suspect a problem with circulation, they could certainly see, at least theoretically, see some improvement in the circulation on the MRI scan based on some of these signal changes, the white spots. But yeah. does that really pertain to the amyloid plaques that we see in you know, recurrent head injuries, like in athletes. So I'm skeptical. Can you tell I'm skeptical? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I think your, uh, your buddy over your right shoulder is a little skeptical too. <laughs> That's right. He did the hyperbaric, didn't help him at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And where's Mr. Lennon? I'm used to seeing John Lennon up on your wall. Is he in the other room? He's at the <laughs> house, actually. He's at the house. We, you we brought him home. Yeah. I should bring him back. I knew you were going to ask about him. Come on, I'm a big I'm a big John Lennon fan. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for that. And and I know in your office, and so any of the athletes uh, that are listening to uh, Dr. Stein works at a lot of athletes as well um, for for these head injuries. And, um, you want you want to go into athletes and, and, and head injuries at all? And before we move on to some other disorders, or you want to stick to stick to some other things. I, I think head injury is an important topic. You know, uh, you know, not just for professional athletes, but you know, for kids that are you know, trying to, uh, you know, preserve neurological function. Their parents are really trying to preserve it for them. Uh, you know, what do, what do we know about repetitive head injury in football, for example, and uh, whether or not that translates to cognitive problems later on? And I, I think the science continues to evolve. I know it does. And, and we're learning more um, about it. And the, the rules that the NFL changed over the past five and 10 years to reduce the risk of concussion. Yeah. That's all being adopted by the, by the, um, by the clubs that are, you know, caring for these kids that are, you know, playing, playing uh, on the weekends here in town. So, you know, I think it's an important topic, but I think the science is going in, in the right direction and we, we will see less accumulated brain damage as a result of these repetitive traumas as we go forward. I, that's another, I think, popular topic where the science is going in the right direction and, and it's, it's something that people are learning. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy the way things are going with that. Do you think, cause I know there was talk about, you know, uh, stopping Pop Warner football and youth football, um, but football is America's sport. I think, I don't think it's going anywhere and it's looking to, take on in different leagues in different, different countries right now as well. And so, um, you know, I think the, they're, they're building these helmets uh, to help. And I know, I know it's helping, but are, are they on the right path for uh, long-term? So the helmets don't help as much as you might think, mm -hmm. even though a lot of really smart people are creating better helmets to reduce the amount of force that gets to the brain. The problem with concussions for most cases is the, is the shaking of the brain in the skull. So the helmet could prevent a uh, skull fracture, for example, and it can absorb some of the energy so it's not transmitted to the brain, but it's the stop and start that really causes the nerve damage in most players. And so the brain gets shaken up, um, even though you have a helmet on and that's what causes the nerve damage and you know, that we're, that we're seeing most often, but just as an, uh, as an interesting aside, I, I, I want to just share with you um, my rugby uh, patient's story because what I learned uh, and I found really interesting was that rugby players who do not wear helmets have or pads. <laughs> yeah. Or pads like football, they have less concussions yeah. than, American football players because they they just take better care of their heads they the way they tackle and and block and so forth they they move their head to the side so they don't have that head to head collision so when you have a helmet sometimes there's a false sense of of security you feel kind of Im impervious because you have a helmet on but that's not true you have to still protect your brain you have to keep your head up when you tackle you don't want to you know put your head down and spear spear yeah, yeah. You know, so I, it's really interesting uh, the way it's going, but I think it's going in the right direction and, and uh, the accumulated brain damage will be less if we can do the studies now again with PET scanning to look yeah. at 
amyloid plaques because that's the pathology that develops in patients with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You mentioned CTE. And, and that's, the, that's the condition that's so scary for so many of these athletes. Yeah. Um, which, again, leads into other things like acute pain and opioid dependence. And can you talk about um, chronic and acute pain um, uh, syndromes? Sure. Oh, that's a huge topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, athletes, just to kind of create the segue, have pain. They get, they get beat up real bad. And they have learned that cannabis works well to control pain, uh, but they're at risk for losing their contracts if the league that they're, you know, enrolled in, that they're employed by, have these, you know, old, you know, cannabis prohibition laws. So we're seeing a change, a sea change in the leagues uh, being more tolerant of cannabis use for medical purposes like pain control so that these professional athletes don't have to take opiates. And, and cannabis is so much safer than opiates that... Um, it's, it seems obvious to almost everybody, uh, except a small minority of what we call the neo, neo prohibitionists. Uh, so that's a whole nother topic. But in general, um, cannabis is very effective for pain control. Um, and for the most patients, uh, if we can get them off opiates, if they're dependent or addicted to opiates, we can transition them to cannabis and they do fine. Probably easier on gut, liver, everything else throughout the body as well, and and bring bringing down the dependence. You know, I've had a few people on our our show recently talking about the benefits of opioids um, that prescribed and following the the way they've been prescribed. There is there they are having some success. Some some patients and knock on wood, I'm not one of those that that in pain. 24 seven, some of the fibromyalgia patients, you know, some Crohn's patients, you know, where they're able to even combine uh, uh, cannabinoid ther therapies with, with opioids and have it, having success. Um, do you ever work with that? Are you, is that part of your practice at all in, in combination? Or are you more, um, let's go with more of a natural route? So I, I listened to that podcast, John. Oh, you did? Okay. With Claudia Morandi and Beth Doss. Okay. And, and I appreciate where they're coming from there are patients that are opioid dependent to control their pain. Mm -hmm. The same way that people with high blood pressure are dependent on their antihypertensive therapy. It's not a bad thing to be dependent. If, you, if you're using a medication and it helps you and, and you need it and you're dependent, that's fine. That's different than addiction. Addiction is when you have a, a psychological drive to use a particular substance even though it's detrimental to you. So that's different. So if you're opioid dependent and you're getting along fine, I don't see a problem with that. As long as there's no addictive related, you know, social and psychological problems. If, if, so people come to me and they're, they're interested in cannabis therapy and they're completely happy and healthy on their chronic opioid therapy. I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, it's, it's okay. And I think that your guests during that uh, podcast that you recently published, um, really, you know, they, they shared that message loud and clear. Um, they also were talking about how the opioid crisis may be uh, amplified or overblown by a, a group of people that are stakeholders in that industry. Uh -huh. and, and that is true. We have had uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, promote opioid use among doctors uh, groups of doctors use it because they get rich from prescribing it. So there's a lot of bad actors out there um, that are part of this opioid conundrum. Um, but there's also a lot of people using opioids that are addicted that want to come off. That's the way I kind of look at it all. And cannabis can help with that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Cannabis can help with that. I believe it can. And, and, and we have research that shows that it can. And we're starting yeah. to understand exactly how that works, which is so exciting. You know, it, we have a lot of uh, uh, rehab centers that call or patients that are in the rehab centers that call. And they're, they're trying to get off of one substance. And they're, they know that they can have success with cannabis doing it, but still because it's a federal uh, a schedule one federal one 
federal scheduling one schedule one substance they're not allowed to have it and um you know and so you know they're, they're looking at it as okay you're getting off one illegal narcotic to try another another one and so you know and you know, it's disappointing because uh, I, I've listened to doctors talk about that in the benefits of cannabis helping to get off of, of pain medicines and other opioids with success and ease, easier on the body. So hopefully a lot of this study that's going on, not only in your practice, um, uh, but also with cannabis and being beneficial for helping uh, pain patients get off of opioids that maybe are, are doing more harm um, that will you know bring this talk talk to the top of the top of the level here. I think um, so. I, I think that uh, you know there's a disconnect between policy and laws and and what's best for people. You know we know there's a disconnect there, yeah. and the whole scheduling of marijuana back in in the '60s with Nixon as a drug that has no medical value and high likelihood of addiction is complete nonsense. Um, so we need to eliminate that whole scheduling, yeah. uh, uh, you know, paradigm and, and replace it with something that's, that's more realistic. It's nonsense, really. Well, we're, we're seeing that, you know, the scheduling, I mean, it's like you said, it's legal in 33 states. You know, it's been legal in the state of California at the medical level since 1996 and 2018, it became recreational level, but 1996, you know, I mean, it's in, it, it, if we didn't live I mean, you know our story with Corinne's father with, with stage four lung cancer metastasized to his brain. You know, if we didn't live in a legal state, we wouldn't have even had that opportunity. It wouldn't have come, it wouldn't have been in our conversation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, thank goodness, you know, it worked on him, yeah. you know, but the only reason it worked, I should say the only reason it worked, one reason why it worked is we were able, we could legally obtain it. Yeah. You know, we had, we had legal access to it. And so hopefully some of this red tape will uh, drop to the wayside with this upcoming election and probably the election after that. And hopefully it's, mm -hmm. it's no more than two that uh, it will be uh, available for a lot of patients. Because I know, you know, when Florida became legal, boy, oh boy, I mean, that we used to, have, we used to get, receive calls from so many Floridians, help, 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 help. And a lot of Floridians, you know, that I still speak to on a regular basis at those time would drive out to fly out to California and however they got their medicine home for their loved one, they did it, you know, and now you know, a lot of these patients don't have to leave their, their state and don't feel like a criminal in doing it too. So, um, you know, so, you know, talk to your Senator, talk to your, 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 your local council men or women and, and see if you can get, you know, get this on the ballot. Um, wherever you live. And you can also, everyone can go to their Department of Health web pages uh, for whatever state, Department of Health uh, Florida, Department of Health California, Department of Health Oregon. Uh, and you can see where your cannabis laws are, what's acceptable, what qualified conditions you have, you know, and, and where you where that falls in and, and who to write to if you have any questions. Um, let's go with, uh, you know, the topic of Parkinson's comes up quite a bit in movement disorders. Uh, Tourette's is another thing. Um, you want to talk about what you're seeing uh, in your practice with those patients? Parkinson's is very common. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it takes different forms and in different patients, different treatments are needed. And cannabis does not always work in Parkinson's. So for example, uh, Parkinson's patients often have a problem with balance and, and they're stooped over and they're shuffling and they fall all the time. Um, cannabis does not really help with that, unfortunately. Um, but if they have a painful muscle stiffness um, and you use cannabis, it can help the muscles relax. Or they can get a more restorative sleep. They can exercise better and maybe it can improve their overall health and mobility by loosening up the muscles, but that stooped shuffling type of motor dysfunction usually does not respond all that well to cannabis. Even speech. My, my, my aunt's going through this. My uncle, uh, his wife, my aunt, you know, she's going through this and he says, you know, her speech is like, almost like she has a stroke, but also like she, she's drunk. 
and they're not using cannabis. Um, so is, can this help? So the speech with Parkinson's patients is usually low volume mm -hmm. and there's no inflection. It's very monotone. So I'm going to give you my Parkinson's um, uh, <laughs> impersonation right now. Okay. So I'm talking like this. I'm talking very quietly and my speech is not going up or down. It's just staying in one volume and one tone. And sometimes it's hard to understand what I'm saying. So there's speech therapy for patients that have that problem. There's a therapy program here called LOUD, L-O-U-D, because patients with Parkinson's look like they might have had a stroke and their speech is affected, but if they can project the air through their lungs and larynx and out, they can do better with their speech. Uh, cannabis, I, I haven't found particularly helpful for that specifically, but what cannabis can do is increase the animation level. So okay. patients with Parkinson's, their facial expressions are, are reduced and they, they, they don't look animated. They look, they look like they have a mask on. In fact, we call it that. We call it a masked facies. And cannabis can help improve that somewhat. But dopamine replacement therapy with Cinemet, one of the old standard pharmaceutical drugs, works great for that. So I think the key to treating a Parkinson's patient is, is integrative. Uh, using conventional therapy like dopamine replacement and also cannabis where it's helpful. For example, cannabis can work quite well for a sleep disorder that Parkinson's patients get. It can work very well for a condition called dyskinesia, which is a, a, an involuntary muscle spasm or tremor. Uh, these are also involuntary muscle contractions. So cannabis works really well to reduce dyskinesia in some patients tremor, it can help with sleep, um, but it doesn't work all that well for the postural and balance problems. You mentioned sleep. You know, how important is sleep? I know how important sleep is. And a lot of times this is almost like a dominant effect. When you don't have sleep, all these other uh, ailments that you may be going through can intensify. You know, uh, pain may be one of them, your balance, uh, stress, anxiety. And so can you talk about the benefits of uh, cannabis and sleep and insomnia? Sure. Well, I'm going to break it down, John. This is the way I analyze all these questions. Cool. You're getting. I'm breaking it, breaking it down. So in Parkinson's patients, they have a unique type of sleep disorder that affects the REM cycle. Okay. And those individuals are not paralyzed. You know, during REM sleep, you're supposed to be paralyzed and your eyes are moving, but the rest of your body is still and you're having lots of dreams. But Parkinson's patients have this REM sleep disorder where they're no longer paralyzed and they're acting out their dreams. They're punching and kicking, they're, they're doing all these kinds of crazy movements. So that's one type of sleep that's important to restore because we know that REM sleep is so important. Yeah. So that's one thing. But then if you take someone else that does not have Parkinson's that has problem with falling asleep, Part, uh, cannabis can be very, very helpful. Well, you know, there's so much um, sedative and relaxation properties to cannabis that's high in myrcene and linalool. And most of the cannabis varieties out there are very high in myrcene. And that's why we call them, quote, indica varieties, because they have a tendency to put you in the couch, as they used to say. But truth be told, it's really more about the chemical composition that makes indica indica when you're talking about effectiveness. And then we're talking about myrcene. And so if you have trouble falling asleep, you want a cannabis product that's high in myrcene and linalool to help you relax and fall asleep. And then there's people with sleep maintenance problems. So they fall asleep fine, but they wake up every two or three hours and they can't get back to sleep. So those individuals do better with edibles because it helps them stay asleep because it lasts throughout the night um, instead of just, you know, vaping or using tinctures, which wear off after a few hours. So, you know, depending on sleep problems with initiation or maintenance or REM sleep disorder, there's all these different types of sleep disorder that you have to unpack, figure out, and then design your therapy specifically for that individual. Do you ever share with your patients that have that interruption of REM sleep, that take an edible, um, 
have something by the side of your bed because if you do good and get up to have a glass of water or go to the restroom or wake up sure take some more to help you to help you go back to sleep absolutely absolutely um, edibles not so much in the middle of the night yeah. because it takes 90 minutes to kick in but yeah. if you if you have a fast acting um edible you know some of the products coming out now are these emulsions that um, make the cannabinoids water soluble. And so you can swallow them and they get absorbed in the upper part of the GI tract and they work relatively quickly. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, usually it's inhalation or tinctures that you want to use in the middle of the night because they, they kick in faster. A couple of times you brought up um, uh, terpenes and I'm a big fan of terpenes. <laughs> and for our listeners, terpenes, everyone knows what a terpene is. It's basically stop and smell the roses. And that, you know, I stop and smell roses wherever I am. And it brings me back to my grandmother, childhood. She, she was a ro the rose queen. And, um, you know, but smelling that smell, it, it brings me back to, to, to that. Um, everyone has essential oils, you know, going in, you know, that, that's a big thing right now, essential oils. Stopping and smelling a citrus, a lemon, a lime. You know, those are different terpenes. Um, uh, linalu, which is lavender, helping for calmness, for sleep. And so uh, each of these terpenes um, have uh, healing and medical benefit, just like the different cannabinoids do. And a lot of companies and a lot of are, are in, in uh, I guess, making products in combination. A lot of whole plant, as you were talking about, you know, already has the natural terpenes in there. I was talking to a doctor recently and and I thought it was great is they would have, you know, lineup of, of, of cannabis there and they would let the patient smell, smell and which one the patient, patient was really drawn to is, you know, is they said, well, let's try that with you. And they were having success from what that the terpene was drawing them to that, that, uh, that certain, I don't like to say strain because strains, I can grow one strain out in California. You could have the same seeds there in Florida and they be di they could be completely different in, in the in the test results. Um, can you talk about that? Because I love that story, and I always share that story of what was down there, and they can uh, even breaking off other clones from the mother plant. Oh yeah, grown, and they're and they're still they're having different uh, uh, results when it comes to testing. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, uh, my disclaimer first is I yes. am not a grower, and I I don't know half or a third or a a tenth of what the growers know, but I did read this study where a variety of cannabis that had certain, you know, um, characteristics when it was grown in one greenhouse had different characteristics, different chemical uh, compositions when those clones were grown in another greenhouse because the soil was different, the light pattern was different, the gases in the atmosphere were different. So in order to create a consistent uh, cannabis variety, there's a lot of different variables you have to control for. And there are companies that are doing this, you know, to the nines. You know, if you look at what GW Pharmaceuticals does to create consistent uh, cannabinoid, you know, profiles for their, for their products like Sativex and Epidiolex, they've, they've created a, a, a condition where those variables are all controlled for and the products are consistent. But for most people, like you said, you take a seed uh, of Northern Lights and, and grow it in you know, one part of town and in another part of town, um, and you're gonna get different plants uh, to some degree. That's, that's at least what I heard and read. And I, I, I it like makes it. Sense. it makes sense because it, you know, it, it's frustrating when you have a patient that calls you and says, you know, I want uh, Blue Dream. And I've been in uh, dispensaries where you go in there and it's not Blue Dream. They're just using, you know, using, using these marketing names. And so I always, you know, share with, with, with patients that call us, look to see, you know, hopefully it'll get, get to that point because if a patient finds something that works for him or her, works for them, and they want to continue on that route of taking it just like you would with a pharmaceutical or Tylenol or Advil, any of those, you know, they want to have consistent every single time. And chances are 
that grower grew that and the next crop didn't turn out exactly the way it did as the first crop, which that patient was having success with. Hopefully it'll get to that point where we're able to have, it's, it's, it's declassified or even unclassified as many would say, and they're able to have these controlled studies uh, as well as the patients will know, oh, you have diabetes, take this. You have Parkinson's, take that. You have dementia, take that. You have cancer, take that. And hopefully that is where uh, this plant will go and to become a medicine, a true medicine again um, with the uh, American Medical Association. You know, are you, what are your thoughts on that? This is, this is it in a nutshell. You, yeah. you, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. There's a spectrum of... Um, product analysis that needs to be done depending on what your indication for use is. So if you have, you know, autism or epilepsy and you need a certain type of cannabis to help you control that problem, you need products that come with their certificate of analysis so you can be sure that you're getting the cannabinoid and terpene profile that's effective for you. Um, and if you're not so ill that you need that level of analysis, fine. Then you can get your cannabis products from, you know, a traditional or heritage grower that smells great when you put your nose in the jar and you don't necessarily need the certificate of analysis because, you know, the nose knows and, and you're going to use that product in the right setting and it's going to work beautifully for you. So this, I think, is going to be the, the spectrum one part at least of the spectrum of cannabinoid medicine going forward. There's going to be the, the medical arm with the highly uh, sophisticated analysis and specific uses. And then there's going to be, you know, the more general type of medical cannabis use, which is akin to recreational or self-medication that may not require that degree of analysis. And, and we'll just have to see how it shakes out. So, with that degree of analysis, are you, um, you know, for those patients that truly need the same consistent dosing every single time? And you mentioned GW Pharmaceutical um, with Sativex and now Epidiolex. Are you, um, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on it? Like I was anti-Epidiolex and all these pharmaceutical companies coming in here. And uh, recently uh, my friend's daughter, uh, she's, 20 now, um, uh, a functioning autistic woman, you know, you know, uh, but has tried cannabis. And again, it was fluctuating all over the place of when, when, one product was working, the next time they would go to the product, it wasn't working and it was up and down, up and down. And so their, their neurologist out in Southern California, uh, you know, said, well, I don't know about cannabis. And so she said, well, there is a pharmaceutical product called Epidiolex. And he, he was kind of brought back and he's like, so if you want something go oh, he was saying there really isn't any regulation okay you want regulation there's a pharmaceutical company write me a prescription you know, it's normally called a recommendation but now because the, the the i guess the government's involved and you and pharmacies are, are are carrying it it's a prescription so he wrote her prescript wrote them a prescription and um they're on and it's working it's a controlled dose every single time and insurance is covering it and they're able to have it insurance covered 100%. It's expensive, but it, but their insurance is covering it. I, I want to. I think they're paying $200, uh, if that. And uh, but it but it is working, and so it's something that I wasn't on board with. But seeing this work, I mean, I, I was blown away, blown away. Uh, and and I know a lot of you know my fellow colleagues in this industry are anti. Um, uh, GW pharmaceutical or epidiolex uh, being being uh, you know uh, a one cannabinoid in there. Um, are you, what are your thoughts on that? You know, working in this industry, uh, um, you know, in neurology as well as working with autistic patients. I think that pharmaceutical companies and and R and D in the cannabis space that promotes single molecule therapeutics is an important part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's the whole part by any, by any means, but it's yeah. important. And so the, the combination, and I, I don't mean to, you know, um, I don't mean to be a hedger here, but 
I truly believe that Western style single molecule pharmaceutical study of cannabinoid medicine has a very important role to play, as does whole plant traditional medicine that we have, you know, so much more to learn about here in the West. So I think there's a role for each. And I can tell you, John, that for my 70 and 80 and 90 year old patients that come in here, cannabis naive and want to try something to help them fall asleep or something during the day to help them, you know, reduce their headaches, for example, or improve behavior. I need that specific CBD to THC ratio. If I don't have that CBD to THC ratio for that patient, I'm, I'm really shooting in the dark and I, and I can't really promise them that the unintended effects of cannabis aren't going to cause a problem for them because those folks don't want to get high. They don't want to be overly sedated. Um, they want to take their medicine in, in a way that they're comfortable taking it that reduces the chances of those psychoactive effects. And the only way to do that is with the help of the pharmaceutical approach of breaking down those cannabinoids, isolating them, and then recombining them, perhaps with the proper sprinkling of terpenes, yeah. and then providing a product that's consistent and effective and safe. But that doesn't mean we still don't need the other, yeah. you know, the, you know, well, the heritage growers and so forth, because yeah. that is so important for reasons that, you know, we don't even understand completely, you know, you, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think that each approach has its, has its role. No, I, I'm, I'm a whole plant advocate all the way. And I just think that you need these other cannabinoids working together, the entourage effect. And, you know, but if something works, you know, I just think, you know, and I share this all the time. There's times people call us and I route them away from cannabis. And I say, you know, I, I do a lot of the, in the integrative oncology world and other, other modalities. And I say, you know, what? I've seen higher success rates with this modality, you may want to try that, you know, and, and see. So, you know, being a health advocate, um, you know, I, I want to help help people as well. The one thing before I want to get off on epidiolics, which is disappointing, is strawberry flavored. You know, and it's just like, come on, guys, you know, why, why strawberry? But again, it's for the taste, and a lot of people don't like the taste. And it's, but I at the same time I'm thinking, well, you don't want people to think it's, you know, when I was a little kid. I had my stomach pump because I had those St. Joseph aspirin that tastes like orange because it tasted delicious, you know, and my parents are out of town. They, they let my grandparents watch me and my uncles and I had a fever and they, they came back in and I'm knocked out. I, I don't even know how old I was, three, maybe four. You were lucky. You were lucky. You could have gotten really sick. Yeah. You know, because it tasted delicious. And I just think when you have something like that with the strawberry flavor, I just hope, you know, it, it, they're not going to just take more and more and more just to do it. But the one thing I have to hand it to the Epidiolex, they have a whole 800 number that's connected to these pharmacies that they have a counselor on hand. And I've been on the calls with them and they know, uh, even if you wanted to try to find your sweet spot, which my friends were doing, you know, they say, well, how come you use, you, you're already out. You shouldn't be out until this time. And they said, well, no, our sweet spot was, this, this, and this, where you had it, you know, calculated for this, 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 and they yeah. said, got it, we'll make notes. And so they'd call, how's everything going? And so, you know, I like that portion of it. And so, and, and again, it gives uh, people legal access um, in all 50 states, you know, not just the 30, 33 states. And it's sad because a lot of conditions, the qualified conditions aren't, you know, you know, pain was just accepted as a qualified condition in the state of Connecticut, where in Utah, epilepsy was legal, but cancer wasn't, you know, and I just think that's, that's, that's wrong. And, you know, and then, then you're kind of forced to play the game and, and I don't say break the law, but you better believe it. You know, me, I'm not advising anybody to do this, but if it was my loved one, I would do anything in my power. Uh, uh, if it, breaking the law was that, I would, I would do it. Uh, to get to get them medicine too. So um, everything leads, you know, sleep is is so important, you know, and sleep, when we have that, when we, it, as I mentioned, it's like a domino effect. You, if you don't ha get your, your, your sleep, I'm, I'm lucky to get six, seven hours. You know, there's times I used to have two hours and there's time, you know, I, I, 
you know, I hear people that go to bed at 10 and they wake up at 10. I'm like, there's no way I, I could do that. You know, I mean, the times I love sleeping like that, if I'm totally jet lagged and I fly overseas and then come back and it's like, oh, okay, I do that once every other year, you know, and get a, get a really good night's sleep. But it sleep is so important that, you know, it could lead to stress, anxiety, and other things that go on that. Can you talk about how important that is and that it can lead to other ailments and the breakdown as well as inflammation in the body as well? I mean, so it has a whole wave pattern of, you know, how important sleep is. Oh, sure. You know, the whole, the whole circadian rhythm, day to night, and all the different biological processes that are functioning during the day and night, if, if that gets messed up, then, you know, things just don't work the way they should. And there's so many different reasons for those problems. Oop. There's trouble with sleep. Oh, there you go. I, lo I lost your, your sound there for a second. Okay. There's a lot of reasons for these different problems to arise. So you want to try to figure out why people are having sleep problems. Uh, I, your volume went down a little. T it, it did, I don't know if your mic, mic is there. And I, We've done so well. I didn't. I didn't want. I didn't want that to 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 end like that. No, I'm good. I there you there you good. You're back. Good. Okay. So your your rhythm. Yeah. So when it comes to sleep issues, uh -huh. the bigger picture is the circadian rhythm. Yeah. You yep. know, are you a shift worker? Um, you know, are are you um, you know, are you drinking too much caffeine? You know, I mean, there's a lot. Are you taking too many Excedrin? People don't even know. There's caffeine and Excedrin sometimes. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do, which we call sleep hygiene. If you can, if you can control your behavior and your lifestyle to improve sleep through, you know, reducing alcohol intake after a certain hour, reducing food intake after a certain hour, um, not taking naps, you know, after three o'clock, you know, there's people. So you want to do the sleep hygiene. Yeah. And then if you're still having trouble with sleep, and you need something to um, recalibrate or, or correct your circadian rhythm, cannabis is great for that. And you're absolutely right. If, if things don't work well uh, with sleep, you can have all sorts of problems. You can become psychotic. You can, you know, you can have hallucinations. You can start acting really crazy. So yes, it's very important. Uh, and I'll, can I just go on a little bit? Come on, this is you. Yeah, I love having you on. All right, there's 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 a um, a process, a normal physiologic process that happens in the brain only when you sleep, and it's called the glymphatic system. The glymphatic, G L Y M. Okay. P H A T I C. You know, everybody knows about the lymphatic system. You want the lymph to flow. The lymph are the fluids in your body that help clean out the garbage. That's the lymphatic system. You have lymph nodes and so forth. Well, in the brain, there's a system called the glymphatic, G-L-Y. Okay. Because it has to do with glial cells. But the point is, the glymphatic system in the brain functions when you're asleep only. And the function, the purpose of that system is to clean out debris and garbage so imagine if you're not having proper sleep and your, your neurons are being bathed in fluid that has all these, you know, metabolites that are, that are gunking up the works, that can't be good, John. So, you know, we don't even know. We're, we're still learning how important sleep is. And now we, we recently learned about this lymphatic system. So I think the take-home message, like you said, is sleep is important. It's, it's, it's super important for, uh, for a healthy day. And there's lots of different reasons. There's just so many different reasons that sleep is wrong or interrupted or not healthful. And cannabis can help sometimes reset circadian rhythms and give people restful sleep, no doubt. Before we go, you know, you and I have talked about the pillars of health. Can you talk about the importance of pillars of health? And, you know, cannabis is great, but health and bringing it all together, keeping the mind uh, alive in, in, you know, you, you've heard these stories or studies, I should say, of the, these, I want to say they're nuns that have uh, the, the, the Parkinson ratio in nuns and dementia ratio in nuns 
is very low because they sit and do crossword puzzles. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Well, there's a thing that yeah. we call it, we call it cognitive reserve. Okay. And if you've studied and read and remained active in terms of brain function, you are more resilient when it comes to aging and losing some neurons. So you have a higher cognitive reserve. You can, you can tolerate losing a few new neurons because you've got all these other connections that you've established. So yes, cognitive reserve is super important. You want to remain active in terms of socialization yes. that helps cognitive function. Which, which and, is tough right now because of this COVID. I mean, a lot of yeah. people, yeah. you know, I have an aunt, she's a nun and she's in a retirement community for nuns, you know, and she's up in upstate New York and she's going nutty because she says they won't let us out of our room. I no. sit here. I can't go out. Can't walk around. My mom said, "You know, you want you want me to send you some 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 snacks or some food." She goes, "They won't even let that in here." And just last week or two weeks ago, they let them out. <laughs> let them out. Let the nuns yeah. out. Right. You let know, the nuns out. To get some to get some fresh air. She's like, "Oh my gosh!" She said, "My happiness came back." And yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and so I must do a lot for the brain. And that's yeah. you know, I think it's important. And I've talked about this about getting out throughout, especially here in this time, and get out, get some exercise, get some vitamin D, um, pick up a new hobby. Can you talk about the pillars of health? We were, and I cut you off on that, but picking up a hobby, if it's playing the piano, you know, doing crossword puzzles, doing something to get that, you know, get that mind going again. Can you, can you share how important that is? It's important. It's important. You know, we have, we have uh, our, our God-given bodies that are supposed to work in a certain way that we can take care of with proper feeding and exercise and fluid balance and promote general health just through maintenance of, of what we have in our own bodies. Because remember, cannabis is just a supplement for our own endocannabinoid system. And if you can take care of your own endocannabinoid levels through proper diet and exercise, and mental health, then you may not need any cannabis supplements. Let's face it. We create in our own bodies endocannabinoids like anandamide and tuarachidonyl glycerol. And there's actually hundreds now of other transmitters and, and you know, lipid molecules that we can, we can use without having to resort to supplemental cannabis to increase our cannabinoid tone, it's called. Um, so yes, the pillars of good health are ever so important for maintaining uh, our general well-being and possibly, uh, you know, uh, enabling us to avoid the need to take supplements, whether it's cannabis supplements or, or vitamin D supplements or vitamin B supplements. You can get a lot of that from your environment and through healthy living. No doubt about it, John. Be before we go... What would you, again, this is not to replace a one-on-one. -on -one. This is Well, you have to do the disclaimer. So this is not to replace <laughs> a one-on-one -on -one with your own personal doctor. Um, you know, what would you recommend uh, for patients on a, on a, on a wellness plan? Uh, just prevent it, like wellness, keeping the body back to balance. In terms of... Uh... In terms of diet and exercise, I'm not a very good proponent right now because I'm in a low phase of those pillars for myself. So I'm just, you know, I'm just being honest here. But in terms of general health, it's it's important to maintain a healthy diet. The Mediterranean diet uh, with healthy oils is very important. Uh, we know that the cognitive part we talked about and the socialization is important. And, and the rest, like we talked about, the, the sleep. So we've been hitting on the different pillars. And if you can maintain socialization and follow a healthy diet, avoid excessive alcohol, chances are you're going to do okay because, you know, there's only so much you can do. And, and I think that in general, you know, our population is becoming more aware of that, at least in, in some demographics. Uh, but um, Unfortunately, you know, most people do need some supplement, you know, they, they don't have enough endocannabinoids or they're deficient because of genetic reasons. We don't really know all about that yet. Um, and for those individual supplemental cannabinoids in the form of, you know, medical cannabis 
it can be super helpful for so many, so many people in so many ways. Well, I, I, pre I appreciate that. And uh, can you share, I mean, you're doing a lot and, and I know you're about to take a trip and I don't know if that's been canceled or not, uh, or are you, are you stuck to present and teach via, via cameras nowadays? Uh, can, you, can you talk about what you're doing, uh, how they can find you? Uh, I know you do consultations uh, via phone, via video, and are you still seeing patients in your office? So please have at it. Well, right now we're um, not seeing patients in the office. Uh, you know, the COVID thing in Florida is awful right now. And uh, we're doing telemedicine. Yeah. Uh, we're doing telemedicine for neurology and also for cannabis. We do have some requirements for face-to-face -face visits. Um, outside of telemedicine, and we do that in our parking lot. So I will put on my mask and I'll go out and patients drive by and I do like a drive up cannabis consult. So, you know, we're doing what we have to do to remain in compliance and also provide the service. Um, as far as other ways that, you know, our clinic neurology of cannabis is functioning, um, I'm doing presentations, mostly it's webinars now. I'm, I'm going to be part of a webinar in uh, Lima, Peru coming up uh, later this month, actually. Um, the Society of Cannabis Clinicians has a, um, has a Latin um, outpost and, uh, and, and they're promoting education in Peru because of the way cannabis laws are changing there. So I'm going to be doing a webinar with other docs uh, to educate the neurologists in Peru. And that's, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm doing a presentation in South Africa with the South African Society of Integrative Medicine. I've been asked to give a few talks out there. So I don't know if we're going to make it out there in April or not, but uh, that may end up being virtual. So I, I love giving presentations. If, if anybody's interested in, in, in getting educated, uh, reach out to our clinic, neurologyofcannabis.com or info at neurologyofcannabis.com. I will see those emails. And I'll be happy to, to do the best I can, uh, you know, remotely for now and in person when that's, when that's possible. When that's possible. So hopefully sooner than later too. So, well, Dr. Stein, always a pleasure. Uh, great having you. Great working with you again. And, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we can be in the same office together again. Yeah. Soon. I hope. For our listeners too, uh, that 60 year old man, there's about to be a grandpa. <laughs> Congratulations yeah. to you and your wife too. Thanks, John. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you soon. Everybody, John Malanka, United Patients Group, be informed and be well. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group, be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA that's right, USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of this hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. It is a family owned business and is deeply committed to the science of providing only the purest hemp and CBD products for the best results and most beneficial experience. Its mission is to bring the therapeutic value of pure organic hemp and CBD to people who seek supplemental relief through the use of healthy natural products. Aspen Green is free from toxins, and runs up to eight different lab tests from bona fide third-party labs throughout its product line. It holds in high regard three foundational principles that guide every aspect of their business, actions, and interactions with their customers, partners, as well as their community. These are quality, integrity, and transparency. These will always remain at the hearts of their efforts to bring their beneficial products to consumers. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPG CBD for 20% off. Again, UPG CBD for 20% off at aspengreen.com.